So uh, Spring Boot is more widely used in the market today, and it's more uh, fuzzy in the uh, enterprise application development side. So uh, how we are going to, uh, I mean, see the Spring Boot uh, differently from the traditional Spring framework that we use, we will be seeing it today. Now, what we are going to discuss here is the base core concepts. Uh, we'll be talking about the features of Spring Boot, and uh, the most important part here is the configuration part. Okay, so that is something very important here to note down because Spring Boot means we talk about auto configuration. So that's the theme behind the Spring Boot application. So that part also we'll be discussing about it. So uh, now here, uh, if you look at it, uh, there are a few uh, definitions that Spring Boot has in it, uh, but I've just split it up with some base definitions. We talk about more of uh, opinions. Okay, it's an opinionated approach of uh, uh, of offerings from the Spring Boot. So this is something an uh, important term that you can make a note of it. So opinionated uh, approach means it provides some default configurations for us. So we don't need to uh, perform configurations. Generally, if you talk about Spring Framework, we deal with too many number of uh, configurations. So in order to develop uh, web applications, we need to configure the dispatcher servlet, starting from the dispatcher servlet configurations. We need to do it uh, manually, but uh, when it comes to the Spring Boot, it offers an opinionated approach of configurations, including the runtime environment itself. Let's say, for example, an embedded Tomcat is there in the Spring Boot, which makes your web application to be uh, spinned up in a, a standalone uh, uh, web environment where it has an embedded container in it, which is nothing but a Tomcat. We'll discuss about that shortly. So mainly the Spring Boot deals with uh, convention over configurations, okay? Uh, no configurations, right? But it, I mean, no configuration means, it doesn't mean that we are completely uh, uh, avoiding the configurations. Of course, yes, we will be doing a configurations, but in much faster way because predefined configurations will be provided by the Spring Boot itself. The, the, the term that's coined here is convention. Okay, please make a note of it. The convention is something very important here because uh, convention over configuration. So convention means instead of going for a configuration uh, mechanism, let's make it a conventional approach of uh, using a default configurations offered by the environment itself. But even though Spring Boot provides certain opinions or default configurations, we can override them. Means we can uh, come up with our own configurations. We can override them uh, and uh, we can eliminate certain configurations that's offered by Spring Boot and we can write our own configurations as well. Okay. So boilerplate setups are handled by uh, Spring Boot and uh, simple dependency managements are there. Embedded app servers are there, uh, which, which is like Tomcat, uh, Jetty, Undertow. These are all different types of... Uh, applications, I mean, web application server, which are integrated into the Spring Boot application itself. So, which helps us in providing an executable jar, right? So the final outcome of the Spring Boot application is going to be a jar. And, uh, and moreover, it has some set of uh, health metrics which we can achieve it. So that is called as actuators, okay? Uh, which we'll be seeing in the, uh, in the course of uh, sessions. So actuators are very important term that we will be using it probably in the upcoming sessions. So next week or the following next week, we'll be discussing about actuators in detail. So these are all some of the points that you can make a note of it. So Spring Boot versus a Spring Framework, if you see. Spring Framework deals with a lot of manual configuration, but Spring Boot helps us in providing auto configuration. Okay, fine. So that is the base understanding behind uh, Spring Boot. If you are a first time learner, then probably you will you can start with Spring Boot itself, but advisably, as I stated, the prerequisite is you need to have some basic knowledge on uh, Spring Core. That's something very important to start your, uh, uh, your understanding of Spring Boot. So with, uh, without Spring Core knowledge, sitting on top of Spring Boot is going to be completely a fresh environment. So it will be very difficult to catch up. So minimum is Spring Core and also advisably, you can have Spring MVC in it, okay? So Spring MVC and Spring Core is more sufficient to have a better survival in Spring Boot platform, okay? Spring Boot application is much faster. So in 10 to 20 seconds, you can just spin up an application and it's more smarter. The reason it's uh, smarter, it's because uh, we have this auto configuration enabled. It's a switch that we uh, use, right? Uh, so you can switch on 
in the auto configuration mode so that uh, Spring Boot will take care of the uh, uh, relevant configurations that's required for your application. Then we have uh, easier uh, configurations if in case you want to perform certain uh, uh, configurations on top of the default, then you'll be using your dot properties file. And as well as we have one format called YAML, yet another markup language, which is another standard of configuration file that is supported only in Spring Boot. But in Spring Framework, we don't have YAML support. But in Spring Boot, we have YAML support. So properties, uh, properties are something that we use, uh, uh, probably you might be aware of, right? So you might be knowing, uh, what property files are. That's exclusively a Java standard uh, uh, configuration file, right? Which has a key and value pair. The same way we use it in the YAML, but that's more standard. And uh, it also extends to the cloud. So you can deploy your application onto the cloud using Docker or so, and then you can use actuators, which you can use it to monitor your application sitting on top of the cloud or on on-premise uh, uh, monitoring can also be done with the help of actuators. So actuator is another, uh, uh, I mean, important uh, feature that uh, Spring Boot offers to us. Okay, fine. So this is something, the base. Uh, we still have many slides, so I don't want to go through slides. Probably I'll shuttle between the slides and the demo. Now, this is the last slide that we are going to see before we get into the demo. There are three ways where we can develop a Spring Boot application. One is through a command line, CLI. Okay, you have a command line CLI tool uh, which you can use, but that's going to use, uh, uh, I mean, a Groovy script. Okay, it's going to use Groovy script. So you know what Groovy Groovy is? It's a JVM based uh, uh, scripting language, right? Which uh, uses a easier script to write your code. So we are not going to sit on top of Groovy Groovy here. We are going to use Java. So we are not going to use the command line tool. Uh, instead, we'll be using IDE itself. Okay. Uh, Spring Tool Suite is the advisable ID for Spring application or Spring Boot application development. Uh, Spring Tool Suite is developed on top of Eclipse, right? So we have, uh, I mean, uh, Eclipse, which we will be uh, using it day in and day out for developing the Java applications, right? The same thing you can use and you can add the plugin if in case required. The STS plugin can be added onto it. But advisably, it's good to have this. Uh, uh, I mean, STS in place if in case you want to develop with Spring Boot application. There's something called Web Initializer, okay, where you have uh, where you have the option to use. Uh, in, I mean, if in case you have some uh, ID problem where you are unable to use the Spring applications, then in that case you can make use of this uh, start.spring.io Web Initializer. This is another way to uh, to quickly uh, create a Spring Boot project and uh, it will get downloaded into your local machine and you can just uh, import them into your IDE. If in case you have some IDE challenges where you are unable to develop, I mean, unable to create a Spring Boot application. So there are three modes, but which mode that we are going to see is the IDE. Uh, probably I can also show you the, uh, the way to create it using the web initializer. Okay, so I guess uh, the theory is sufficient. Let's get into the demo and see the see it in action. So right now I'm using the STS. You can see that, right? So we have uh, the uh, the look and feel is same as an Eclipse IDE. There's no much of a difference. I'm using a Mac operating system, but if in case if you are with the Windows environment, there's no there's going to be no much of a difference other than the key combinations. So rest is all the same. Okay. Uh, so so uh, you need not worry that the demo is shown on the Mac operating system. Will it be uh, sufficient to learn the Spring Boot and practice them back in Windows. Of course, yes, because nothing to talk about here in the Mac operating system. We are going to sit only on top of the IDE itself, right? So IDE functionality is all same uh, across uh, uh, the operating systems. Whether you make it uh, into Mac or Windows doesn't matter. Okay, so it's a fresh uh, IDE. I have a fresh Project Explorer on the left-hand side, and uh, you can notice that as a way to create a uh, Spring Starter project. Okay, so this is uh, probably this might not be visible for you uh, because um, it's, it's uh, there's a challenge in uh, increasing the front size of the pro Project Explorer from the Mac operating system. So what I'm trying to explain here is there's a way where you can just go to File, New, and then use Spring Starter Project. So the same way which you do it in the Windows as well. So in the Windows environment, you open the Spring Tool Suite and go for the File, 
new and then click on the spring startup project okay so this is a way where you will be using it when you are doing it on top of the um the sts okay uh, spring tool suite uh, but if it is an eclipse you need to have a plugin installed okay Otherwise, uh, it will be a little challenging for you to uh, cook up your Spring Boot project. So this is using IDE, which we can create. The other way, as I said, it's a Spring Startup project, which we can use it. So that's what I was uh, start talking about, start.spring.io. So let's get into start.spring.io. You can stop me if in case you have any questions, okay? Since it's more of virtual, so it's quite difficult to understand uh, your understanding from my uh, uh, from my session. So if in case you have any questions, please do let me know. So here I've just stepped into start.spring.io and uh, this is a Spring Initializer page from where you can develop your Spring Boot project quickly. Uh, so let's say, for example, I'm just going to cook up a com dot uh, e commerce dot app and this is a group ID so the version that currently been uh, used is 2.7.0 okay um, and there are some snapshot releases are there uh, which is three snapshot releases also there but a default is selected to 2.7.0 and then we have uh, the jar of war archive to be generated out of this uh, project. Uh, default is jar, but if in case you want to convert it to war, you can do so. Uh, we will see this demo on the next week, how to convert your Spring Boot application from uh, jar archive to war, traditionally to deploy in some web logic server. So technically I was talking about it. We have an embedded server in the Tom, I mean in the Spring Boot application. Uh, instead of having an embedded Tomcat, let's move out of the conventional way and then go into the traditional way of using a uh, web archive uh, where we can deploy the sp same Spring Boot application into some web logic server. Uh, and the default uh, version of Java that's selected here for this uh, version of Spring Boot is 17, but it's supported from 8, 11, 17, and 18. OK, you can go for any of the choice of this. And then here is where you have the dependencies to be added. So you can just click on add dependency and search for some of the dependencies that you want to add in. So let's say web dependencies and I want to add some uh mongo dependencies so if you search in you will be getting the uh, dependencies so start data mongodb it's a no sql database which i want to plug in so by this way you can add your uh, dependencies into the dependencies section and that's it we are done with it we can go ahead and uh, click on generate so this generate will generate um a zip file okay technically you can see it's a zip file right so you can extract them post extracting it you can import it into your ide okay if in case you have some ide challenges in order to connect to the uh, spring boot starter io so let's go back to this ide again now what you're seeing here is the same thing what i explained on the uh, start.spring.io web page the same thing is what you're seeing here. You can notice that actually this is connected to the start.spring.io. Okay, please notice that even in spite of an ID, ID is actually hitting to that particular service URL. And from there, it's pulling out all the um, uh, artifacts of the project uh, settings. So like as I'm talking about, you can use the packaging jar, language, Java. Java version is defaulted to 17. We have a Maven project selected group id artifact versions everything which you can keep feeding in uh, but these are coming in it's because of the connect to the service url if you have some challenge in the connectivity of the service url the id will be unable to connect like let's say for example if you have your official uh, laptops where you have a proxy challenges then probably you will be unable to connect to this so if you have your open network then then it's not going to be a big deal but if you have some a network which is sitting on top of the proxy of your particular organizations then probably you'll be having a difficulty in connecting to it so what i advise is either you go to the web page directly here and then try to create your spring boot project from here or if in case you have flexibility to create it from your id itself then it's well and good use your id itself 
let me go ahead and create this e-commerce app. Uh, this is just a, a simple application. So next week we'll be going through some case study. OK, I thought of bringing in some case study, uh, probably nearer to the real time case study, and then we'll try to work on top of that. And one more thing that I would like to mention here is either you can go for a Maven project or you can go for the Gradle project. OK, Maven or Gradle is your uh, can be your choice of uh, build tool. So I'm defaulted to Maven and whether it's a jar or war, you can choose accordingly defaulted to jar and the languages that are supported for Spring Boot is Kotlin, Groovy and Java. Kotlin is the language that we use in Android today, right? So Android applications are developed using Kotlin and then we have a Groovy as I already stated. But uh, default, let's go for Java because we are going to develop uh, enterprise graded application. So there's no choice for us to go for Kotlin or um, Groovy. OK, so let's go for defining. These are something which you are, might be already aware of since you are already working on the Java based application development platform. So I don't want to define much on Maven setups. So com dot e commerce dot app. So I guess we are good to go. So package. Let's take this. And uh, if you notice that we need to add the dependencies here, we had the choice for adding the dependencies, right? So I clicked on the add dependencies and then we added the same way here. Also you have it. So if you just hit next, you'll be having the choice to select your dependencies. Let's say I want to use web dependency. Just go and click on Spring Web. If you want to use uh, security, you have the security dependencies. You want to connect to AWS related uh, functionalities. Uh, that might be a cloud choice. I guess they might have been removed. So there are different uh, cloud based tools that are available which we can use. I guess AWS is not there. We have Azure support. OK, so these are different dependencies that are provided by uh, the Spring Boot environment. OK, so as I was talking about the actuator, we need to externally uh, use this dependency in order to bring in the actuator. Data JPA, OK, uh, security, MySQL driver, Spring Web. So whatever dependencies that you wanted, you can just select search and then select and then uh, keep going to create more uh, 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 I mean more uh, requirement specific applications. So I'm not choosing anything. So meaning us no dependencies. OK, no dependencies uh, I'm choosing here. Uh, the reason I'm not choosing any dependencies is because we are not going to see this as a web application instead as standalone. Uh, uh, a technically a kind of a spring core application. OK, so that's how I'm trying to design this as so I'm leaving it off. No choice of uh, the dependencies up here. So just hit next and then hit finish. So it'll all the way download the zip file and then it'll extract it and it'll import it successfully into our uh, project explorer. So that's how uh, the ID works. What we do here on the web page is we manually go ahead and generate it, downloads the zip file, and then uh, uh, and then we go ahead and extract them so this is the zip file e-commerce app so this we need to extract it and then we need to import it but luckily in id we don't need to do it it connects to the uh, the service url uh, based on the configurations that we have provided on the uh, prompt box based on that it will create a project and then it will download the zip file extract it and import it automatically so all these are uh, done automatically from the id perspective and one thing that you have to notice here is the boot. I'm not sure if it's visible. Uh, might be it's more tiny uh, view. So there is a label okay, called boot is there engraved on the project. So so what does this uh, boot says is. OK, uh, it says it's a spring boot enabled project. There is a meaning. OK, it is nothing but a spring boot enabled project. Right. So that's just to give a notification 
uh, when you look at the project to understand that it is a Spring Boot project. Rest is all the Maven structure. I hope you might be aware of the Maven structure here, right? So it's a complete Maven structure and uh, we have the main Java. We have the resources uh, where we have the application.properties file. Default is dot properties. As I was talking about, we can also use YAML file dot YML extension of a configuration file under the resources directory. All your dot Java files will get into this uh, base package from the base package com dot ecommerce dot app. OK, and we have a POM dot XML file. Let's dwell into it and see what's there inside this POM dot XML file. So the once uh, you load this POM dot XML file, uh, we have a dependency tab. Just get into there and notice that we don't have anything other than the uh, starter. OK, and that is something called test. So this is the only thing that we have here. OK, and uh, nothing much. So. So what it means is we don't have a web. So why we don't have a web is because uh, I didn't include the dependency. I didn't include the JPA Java persistence API dependency. I didn't include anything on security. So no dependencies you are seeing only the default dependency, which is nothing but Spring Boot starter. OK, that's the default dependency that you will get if in case you don't choose explicitly any dependencies from the dependencies list while you're creating the project. So this is defaulted and you also have a test. If in case you want to exclude from the test, you can avoid this test. OK, but right now I'm not doing it. So let's go back. And see what we can do with this. We need to understand how this Spring Boot works. So we have. A better way to understand this. I'll just explain you how this auto configuration works. That's something very important. This is the piece of code. OK, uh, it all starts from here. The entry point of the Spring Boot application is. From here, if you notice we have a main method. OK, uh, I told you that it's a standalone application, right? So obviously we need to have a main method and uh, from here where the application is getting bootstrapped and uh, all the dependencies and everything is getting captured. The dependency injection happens. Uh, everything starts from this particular point of line by executing your uh, main method. OK, so why we need to have a main method if it is going to be a web application, let's say if it's a spring web application I want to develop uh, in a spring boot, then why do we need to have a main? Uh, as I said, it's a standalone. It's a standalone web application uh, self executable, right? We don't need to launch them in some external containers like WebLogic or Tomcat external Tomcat. It has an embedded Tomcat in it, so that's why you have an entry point since it's termed as a standalone. It's like starting with the main method. You can just uh, create a jar archive and then put it into the Docker and run the application from there. That's all as simple as that. So you can dockerize your application much faster if it's going to be with the embedded Tomcat. In your Docker, in your Docker environment, in the Docker container, you don't need to have any uh, uh, any uh, explicit servers, so you don't need to uh, pull any Tomcat image OK into your uh, Docker container. Right, so there is no need of uh, Tomcat image because Tomcat is already embedded into your application. You just create a jar and then put the jar into the con uh, into the uh, uh, create uh, put the jar into the Docker image and uh, spin up a container out of the image and that's it. Your application is up and running as simple as that, right? So the main method, the reason we talk about the main method here, it's because stand alone self executable jar application. OK, but if in case we want to push them into some external uh, servers like let's say WebLogic, OK, which we will be seeing it in the upcoming days. So WebLogic or somewhere like uh, in external Tomcat server, then probably we need to do a little bit of configurations. And at that time you will not be in term of using this main method. OK, there's no need for using the main method at that time so that we will see later. But right now you just understand since I talk about the term called standalone, we are using this uh, main method at point at present and what this particular line is doing we will come to that a bit later because we need to understand a lot of basics before we step into all these lines. OK, now. According to the slide. So this is what. Um, initially, which we used to do to develop a Spring Boot application. OK, so 
if you notice. Um, this is an application, the class. It has a main method and we have the. Uh, spring application dot run method which invokes your configuration class. So which is your configuration class is this one. Demo application is your configuration class and we have the arguments which you can pass in order to manipulate your uh, command line arguments as well. But uh, how this is sufficient to spin up your Spring Boot application? It's it's happening with the help of this layer. You can see that. OK, at configuration, whenever you go for uh, Spring application development, if it's a Java based configuration, you will start with at configuration. Number one. Number two, you'll be using at component scan. OK, in order to scan all your component classes, OK, and automatically uh, create an instance for it. So these informations are given to your uh, IOC container, right? So it's a Java based uh, configurations that we use uh, with the help of at configuration and at component scan. Added to that, you can see there is an at enable auto configuration. OK, this is a switch. This becomes a switch. OK, at enable auto configuration is a switch. If you add the switch, it means you are switching on. Uh, so what you're switching on here is you're switching on the auto configuration for your Spring Boot application. So initially we used to use these three annotations, but today we have advanced by just using a single annotation called at Spring Boot application, which internally has all these three annotations. In the initial days of Spring Boot development, we used to provide three annotations explicitly. Uh, at configuration, at enable auto configuration and at component scan. But later we got uh, replaced with this three annotations into a single annotation called at Spring Boot application. OK, so that's something uh, uh, added advantage for the developer in order to anyways, it's all auto created classes, but still I'm just saying so you don't need to use those three common annotations so you can notice that. The three common annotations in the Spring Boot applications are configuration, component scan, at enable auto configuration. So what is that configuration, which you all knew that either it's a Java based configuration or XML based configuration, which you can use. But at configuration technically says that this class is going to be kept as a configuration class. It's a Java based configuration. OK, uh, so it's a Java based configuration class equivalent to your XML configuration. And uh, component scan looks for all the components, uh, service classes, repositories, uh, controllers, REST controllers. So all those components will be scanned for and it will launch them as a spring boot, spring beans, and IOC container will start in instantiating those beans. The most important thing is your uh, at enable auto configuration. So at enable auto configuration is used for master runtime switch, master runtime switch for spring boot examines your application context and creates missing beans based on intelligent defaults. That's what I was talking about, intelligent default. So by default, it will start creating the instance for the beans that is required for that application based on the dependency that you have added on the uh, class path. OK, you know, on the class path, if you add a Mongo. Mongo DB dependency, OK, Spring Boot Mongo DB dependency. At enable auto configuration will automatically cook up all the relevant required uh, beans for that particular Mongo MongoDB's uh, uh, MongoDB connectivity. So including your uh, uh, your data source information or whatever needed. So this auto configuration enable auto configuration is helping us to achieve that process of uh, automatically creating the configurations that's required for any particular dependencies. OK, so that is uh, that is the uh, understanding of what auto configuration. But all these three at auto configurations are right. I mean, all these three. Um, sorry, all the three annotations are now clubbed into a single annotations, as I stated. That is nothing but your uh, Spring Boot application at Spring Boot application. So. Uh, small information that introduced from 1.2.x version of Spring Boot. At Spring Boot application annotation got introduced from this version, okay, which replaces this three annotation. At configuration plus at component scan plus at enable auto configuration is what is equivalent to your at Spring Boot application annotation. Three annotations is reduced to one single annotation to demarcate this particular application as a Spring Boot application. Without this at Spring Boot application annotations, you cannot call your application as a Spring Boot application. Please make a note on that. So now you can notice that we have the Spring Boot. 
uh, application here, right? So let me hover my cursor on top of it and see what's going to be there as a intrinsic uh, annotations. So I hope it's visible. You can see that uh, configuration, okay? At configuration is what they now call it as at Spring Boot configuration, at enable auto configuration, okay? At component scan. These three annotations are already built in into the at Spring Boot application annotation. OK, so we don't need to provide that three annotations anymore. Rather, just use one single annotation. So you will have a startup class, which is like auto create a class. If you want to change the name of the class, you please go ahead and change the name of the class. Not a problem. But while you create your project itself by default, based on the project name, e-commerce app application is created. OK, added with a uh, suffix of application term. OK, if you just use e-commerce as the project name, then it's going to be e-commerce application. And inside that, it's going to uh, stuff in with the main method and that is a spring application dot run. This liner is what is going to help us in invoking the container. Which container it's going to invoke? The IOC container. OK, uh, technically speaking, it's going to be uh, representing the application context. Application context. So application context is the representative of your IOC container, which we all knew that, right? If in case you want to communicate with the container, then we do it through application context. The spring core is nothing but IOC container, right? So application context uh, is the actual return of this run method. So when it is invoking the run, what technically happens is it's actually invoking the IOC container and handing over the configuration class to it. And in the configuration class, since there is auto configuration enabled and component scans are there, it will search for all the bean Spring Bean classes and start creating an instances. Uh, uh, and also for the configuration classes, it will create an instances. So this class will be acted as your configuration class since we have that annotation here called at configuration, right? We already have that annotation here representing that this class is a configuration class. And this arguments is for added uh, informations. If in case you want to manipulate that arguments, you can manipulate that. If I hover the cursor here on the run, you can see the written type. The written type is written type is uh, configurable application context, which is a uh, type of application context. This is what we need in order to work with your base Spring application, right? So, so you can see that this is this is how it looks like. Let's import the application context. And that's it. You're ready to use your container. We're using this code. So you can go and invoke something from the container. So let's say I want some bean. So get bean. Right. So ask for a bean. So let's say I want a bean called um, uh, product dot class. Right. So I want the product dot class, uh, but technically we don't have a product or let's say product service dot class. We don't have that uh, product service. So let's go ahead and create the product service. App dot so service. Product service, right? Just click finish. And this product service is going to be demarcated as at service or at component or whatever. So let's go for at component at present. And inside to this, we can have some method public string get product. Right? So return some string message. So this is just a string that we are trying to return out of this uh, get products. OK, so what we are going to do is just go back to your. E-commerce application main class. Just a second, let me do a refresh. So inside the 
product service. We need a product service. So I'm just importing the product service. And we have this product service here. Okay. So what happens is we are prompting for this product service instance, which is going to be cooked up by the IOC container at the at the bootstrap time of this application. And you can get in turn the product service object. All right. Then just in book. Put us this out. Product service dot get products. That's it. So see how faster we were able to create an application, right? So dependency managements are not going to be in place. We are not going to do uh, too much of configurations. Anyways, this is a very simplified applications, but when we grow into bigger applications, then only you will uh, realize the essence of uh, Spring Boot actually. So let me go ahead and trigger the application. It's not a web application, so it's not going to have any embedded servers or web dependencies. Nothing is going to be there. It's going to just carry the Spring Core dependencies. Great. Now you can see there's an output called iPad M2 chip enabled. So this uh, response is coming from invoking this method called, oops, that's a spelling mistake. Get products. <laughs> right. So run this. And I stated that this is not a web application. So it's going to run this application and step out of its uh, running environment. That's it. Your application is stopped right now. You can notice that from the console. OK, but you can see that we printed the uh, the uh, written written value of that get products method. So how come we got this bean, the product service bean? It's because we already demarcated the class as that component. And who's searching for this component? Your IOC container. How come it can search for that component? It's because we have component scan enabled here. At component scan is enabled. And how it's default going to all the sub packages? It, because I've created a sub package based on the base package, com.ecommerce.app, com.ecommerce.app.service. So the component scan will do defaulted starting from the app package and it'll go intrinsically, transitively to say it'll go to all levels of sub packages and keep, keep. Uh, keep digging uh, the uh, child level uh, packages and then try to figure out if there are any components available, then automatically it's going to create an instance out of it and keep it ready in the instance pool. And from the pool, we are trying to invoke that instance whenever we, we call the, uh, the instance from the IOC container. And defaulted, it's going to be a singleton beam. So you're going to get only one instance at how many, how many number of times that you're going to invoke to the IOC container of the same beans request, it's going to return only one single instance because default it's going to be a singleton bean. Uh, so, e hello, yeah, yeah, yes, please. Uh, sir, like one doubt, sir. Uh, yes, yes, please. In the fourteenth line, you told that uh, it automatically creates the like uh, input container of uh, like application context. Yeah, yeah. Uh, application like, is context, it by yes. default or like uh, like or else like, can we take the like default listable container also? Uh, you want to cook up your own application context? Yeah, I mean the bean factory is uh, like deprecated. I know that, but after that, I wanna use uh, if I wanna use the like default listable container. Like, can I use that or else only we can use the application context? Yeah, see, uh, since we are using annotations here, right? So if it is an, uh, uh, I mean, the the uh, annotation based dependencies are more involved here. So the only choice that we have is to use only application context because the option that you get out of the run here is only your application context type. You will not get the choice to work with Bean Factory because we are not going to use any of the XML environments here. It's only through annotations. So the only choice of container to be used, uh, the representative for the container to be used is your application context. It's the first level, but probably if in case you are going to the next level of um, web and web application, okay. Uh, like I'm talking about the like default listable. A default? No, default listable container. Ah, see, uh, that is something that you are trying to customize out of it. If in case you want to customize it, yes, of course you can do it. But don't rely on the spring application.run. 
you're getting it so if yeah. in case you wanted to have a, a customized way of uh, the container representatives to be used it's better not to use the spring application dot run then we have to cook up the code again you're getting it but yes of course we can use it see uh, spring boot can be taken back to the older style of even using an xml it's not just about using only the uh, annotation based here or Java based configurations. We can also pull the XML base. So any older style you can take your Spring Boot. It's completely customizable. But uh, leaving it to the default, uh, we are trying to use application context. But if in case you have a requirement where you want to have a customized kind of context, yes, of course you can do that as well. You can use that. Is it clear? It's a thing. Yeah. So yeah, the the reason I was trying to explain this part is not to just uh, uh, understand the way of using the container because you might be knowing how to use a container or uh, how to invoke the container using the context. The idea behind this is uh, we have been seeing the Spring Boot applications used only on top of the web application development, uh, but that's not the actual case. Spring Boot can be used even for creating a standalone application okay now as the question arised i wanted to highlight this this piece of thing okay let me eliminate this and uh, let me create my own container okay and represent this e-commerce application class it will still work okay you don't need to rely on this default run method which invokes a configurable application context what this does is internally helping us to give a uh, uh, a predefined configured context object so that everything is more smooth with the Spring Boot application. If you want to override this and work, yes, of course, you can do all customization work, but the only thing is we need to hard code everything. Okay, so the main idea of Spring Boot is to reduce and eliminate the boilerplate code, but there are a few requirements because you might be migrating your project. Let's say your project is on a traditional Spring Framework applications and you are intended to use the uh, context object, a default context object, then typically you cannot use application context at that time. Of course, you can customize it, but try to do uh, try to do manual code work in order to achieve that. Okay, so yeah, so that's something uh, good to get that question because we can highlight that it's completely customizable. Spring Boot is completely customizable according to your need. You can do it to whatever extent that you want it uh yeah i guess uh, this is something the base i wanted to give you compared to the slide which i've shown okay so this is what i was talking about the convention over configurations uh what is that convention over configuration uh, means technically is uh, this slide can help you to understand okay uh, i just wanted to uh, show you the slide so if you look at it technically uh, while we are working with entity right uh, it's more of convention. So let's say you work with JPA, Java Persistence API, and you are uh, using an entity class to be created. So at the time, there's a way to define your, uh, uh, I mean your table. So let's say uh, in the database, uh, the uh, you have a class called Sales. Okay, entity class is Sales. Then in the database, it's going to create it as a Sales, right? By defaulted. But you can override that if in case you want to create it as a product sales, then you will be using a table annotation and uh, there you will be able to provide a name for the table uh, rather than taking the default class name. So class name is sales, but you want the table name to be a product sales, which you can do it right. So this is going to be overriding the convention. What is the default convention? Default convention is when the class name is sales, it will take the database table or name also sales. That's what the convention is all about. But if you want to go back to the configuration, then you do this configuration again. So either you depend on the convention or you depend on the configuration. Spring Boot is helping you to come out of the box. OK, uh, extend your uh, custom configurations to be imparted into your uh, Spring Boot application. So in that case, we need to eliminate certain default configurations that's going to be offered by Spring Boot. That's the kind of a demo that I'm going to show you next. But before that, I just wanted to give you this clue of what that convention means. Spring Boot is all about convention over configuration. So it's it's defaulted state of configuring your applications based on the dependencies that you add in your class path. OK, so that's the definition. So Spring Boot means auto configuration. That's something uh, need to be registered 
uh, before we learn more on Spring Boot. Yeah, so uh, if uh, I guess uh, here itself, we have many tweak arounds which we can do here, but uh, I'm not going to spend much time here. We'll take it up uh, in the later course. But right now, this is the first thing that you are seeing as a Spring Boot application is up and running uh, with the essential application context invocation and accessing a specific bean and uh, invoking the uh, service method of that bean class. That's all. So uh, I wanted to show you certain things. If you if you dig into the Maven dependencies, you will notice there is a Maven dependencies because it's a Maven uh, tool, Maven build tool being used for this project, right? So in the Maven dependencies, you'll be finding something called Spring Boot starters. Under that, what you will see is uh, Spring context. So you can notice here, okay, I'm unable to write it on that side. So you have spring context, you have uh, AOP, you have beans, you have expression. All these are coming from the spring framework. So spring boot is completely inclined to the spring framework only. It's not <clears throat> something, a magical framework that we are bringing in. Spring framework is, uh, is a bigger umbrella, which has, I'm sorry, spring boot is a bigger umbrella, which has a Spring Framework in it. Without that Spring Framework based dependencies, Spring Boot doesn't work. Even though we call it as a Spring Boot starter uh, packages, they have intrins uh, intrinsic dependencies or uh, transitive dependencies are going to be coming from the Spring Framework only. Okay, so that's why you have the Spring Boot, Spring Context, Spring AOP, and so on. Right, so uh, this thing that you need to go and investigate and one thing that you have to look here is Spring Boot Auto Configure. Okay, this is the magical uh, 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 library that makes the Spring Boot to work as it should be. So if you expand here, you'll be seeing all the uh, default uh, dependencies are mentioned. So let's say, for example, you want to use uh, JDBC. Okay. Uh, and uh, you have a JDBC, uh, Spring Boot JDBC library. Here you have. So org.springframework.boot.autoconfigure.data.jdbc. Right. Here there is a, a, a JDBC repositories auto configurations are there. Okay. This is for data JDBC. But we do have a specific JDBC dependencies alone. I'm just taking you there. Yeah, here. So if you look at this, there is a data source auto configuration class is there. This data source auto configuration class is helping the JDBC data source to be cooked up based on the database driver that you've added in your dependency. If you have added H2 in-memory database, then the data source will be automatically created on top of the H2 in-memory database. If in case you have the MySQL driver included, then your configurations in the application.properties files are MySQL database configurations, then automatically MySQL uh, data source will be generated with the help of data source auto configuration. So if you uh, dwell into this class, you can see a lot of uh, code being written, okay, which technically uses something called at auto configuration. And there is something called at conditional on class, <coughs> okay, where it should have data source dot class, embedded data base type dot class. If these classes are identified, then this class will be uh, uh, will will be uh, uh, executed in order to start cooking up the data source uh, object or data source instance, right? So there are some set of uh, uh, logical codes are uh, dealt here. But anyways, what we need to understand is like this, there are hundreds of configuration classes are there. This is for JDBC. If you go for, let's say you have something called security, okay, you have security based uh, auto configurations then uh, you go for mongo mongodb no sql database so for that you'll be having uh, here mongo right so mongo auto configuration so for every dependency you have auto configurations right so the first thing that we are going to explore here is jdbc right now if you notice you don't have any dependencies. There are no dependencies, right? 
So what I'm going to do right now is firstly, let me get into this e-commerce app. OK, this is just to understand how the Spring Boot is all working. That's something very important, right? So that is that is where we gain more knowledge on understanding the depth of that particular technology. So we need to go and dwell into it and see how it's functioning. So I take you to this e-commerce app. So from here, let's quickly. MVN clean package. So I'm trying to. Package this application and so you will see inside the target. Uh, a jar file that gets generated. Great. So let's step into target successfully packaged it. Now you can notice that there is a. Jar file, right? Still have another 30 more minutes. So this is a jar file what you're noticing here. So we I, I told you right the default uh, archive that will be generated using the build tool is all about jar files. OK, so now when I'm talking about this. Archive, I need to go ahead and. Uh, execute this. So Java space hyphen jar. And uh, e-commerce jar hyphen hyphen debug. I'm enabling this uh, debug. Option, please notice the reason I'm enabling us to visualize. Uh, what's actually happening from the auto configuration part? So right now I'm running this archive. OK, the artifact, the jar is in binary artifact. So I'm trying to uh, spin up this artifact and execute it and see what's going to happen in the debug option. So hit enter. Great, as we expected, it's happening. You can see in the on the debug mode. OK, uh, we can explore. This when it is on the console. OK, on the console you can explore this. So what is happening here is. Conditions evaluation report. It generates a con uh, conditions evaluation report. There's something called positive match. What is positive match? Positive match of configuration means it loads all the auto configurations which are matched with the dependencies that are available in the class path. So what are the dependencies available? We have AOP, we have uh, core, spring core, spring AOP, right? Spring beans, all those are default dependencies which are already available. For the dependencies, whatever auto configurations are there, all those auto configurations are executed. AOP auto configurations, okay? Lifecycle auto configurations. So all these are positive matches. Positive means these configurations are loaded to configure your application because these configurations are mapped with the dependencies. But down you will see negative matches. Negative matches are the configurations which are not loaded. Why it is not loaded? Because it is not matched. It is not matched with the dependencies. Let's say you don't have active MQ dependency included in your in your POM.xml file, right? You don't have Mongo. If you go and see Mongo will be there. Redis, okay, Cassandra. So all these are not loaded. Why these auto configurations are not loaded? Already it's there, but it's not loaded. GraphQL because these dependencies are not added into our class path, the libraries. OK, so in the POM.xml, whatever libraries that you have defined or dependencies you have defined based on the dependencies, if the Spring Boot can match the auto configuration classes, then it is going to be called as a positive match. If it's not matched in the dependencies, then it is going to be called as a negative match. And one more thing you have see list of uh, negative match because these many auto configurations are there, but we don't have enough uh, dependencies to match to those auto configurations to get loaded at the runtime. You have exclusions list if in case you don't want to use the 
default auto configuration classes. Then you can exclude them explicitly and those excluded uh, exclusion list of uh, auto configuration class will be listed out here. Right now we haven't excluded anything. We have instructed the Spring Boot to make use of the default um, auto configurations and I haven't explicitly mentioned any exclusions of the auto configuration classes. So in the exclusions list you will not see anything. OK, and uh, moreover, these are the unconditional classes which are getting loaded on top of the positive matches. OK, so this is how it will be practically working when you spin up a Spring Boot application during the bootstrap time of your application. All these configuration classes are getting loaded based on the availability of the dependencies. So here you should have. So if you add one more Spring Boot dependency, it's all started with Spring Boot starter. OK, starter with uh, MySQL, let's say. Starter with uh, Redis. OK, starter with Cassandra. So if you have all these starter packages at the libraries, then their respective auto configuration classes will be loaded and it will configure the relevant uh, instances for these particular dependencies. And we don't need to cook up those instances. Just we need to give some configuration details in the application.properties file. Rest will be assured your Spring Boot auto configuration will cook up all the uh, dependencies. Uh, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, the configurations. So we don't need to technically do it. So this is how you can explore your uh, configuration classes. The same thing which you can do it on your uh, IDE also. OK, so right click run as run on configuration. And uh, here you have the option called enable debug. Output OK in the Spring Boot tab. OK, from your e-commerce application, right? You have this enable debug auto uh, output. So just go ahead and uh, enable that and run. Now whatever I've shown there on the console or the terminal is what you're going to see here on your ID itself. See all those positive matches and the negative matches are listed. These are negative matches. Right negative matches and these are your positive matches. OK. So by this way you can explore more on how these auto configurations are getting loaded. Now let's explore in the positive match. There is no there is no uh, web uh, web related dependencies. OK, spring web related dependencies are not there in the positive match. So what I'm going to do right now <coughs> is go and add. Spring iPhone web. Choose. Ends forth when you're working on top of the spring boot. OK, you're going to choose only. Spring Boot Starter. The prefixing should be Spring Boot Starter. It's a standard naming convention that's been used by uh, Spring Community. OK, Spring Boot Starter Web. But usually we will say what? Spring Web, Spring iPhone Web. But now it's going to be Spring Boot Starter Web. Right? So just go ahead and choose them. Now one dependency is getting added into our class path. The moment it is added, OK. <clears throat> OK, so the moment it is added. And let's go ahead and run it. Run configuration. Auto mode. Now this is a web applications, right? So if you see here, on the positive match, okay, on the positive match, a lot of new things are appearing, like embedded web server. Okay, you have uh, embedded web servers, right? MVC error MVC configurations, right? Dispatcher servlet, dispatcher servlet auto configuration. Dispatcher servlet is required, right? That's your uh, front end controller, right? So you need a dispatcher servlet. So that is auto configured. But think about, I'm not sure how many of them have worked with Spring Framework traditionally. It takes much time to configure the dispatcher servlet. But today we already have the dispatcher servlet auto configuration, which will enable the dispatcher servlet. Whatever is essentially required will be configured automatically and it 
creates an instance in instructing the IOC container to create an instance of the dispatcher solver and keep it ready. So now what uh, what happens here is we are uh, we are technically trying to use this configurations effectively uh, rather than we manually go and configure. So that's what the convention over configuration is. So see so many positive uh, matches are there right now just by adding the spring web dependencies. These are negative matches. Still, we have many more, many more auto configuration classes, which are which are not picked up, and exclusion list is none, and you have unconditional classes, which is also listed here. Now, if I want to go for exclusions, then we can think of having it. Let me remove this for a while. If in case you have any questions, please do let me know. Okay. So let's go to the dependencies. Remove the web. Okay, for time being, okay, we are only exploring the entire Spring Boot, uh, Spring Boot. Uh, I mean, the work progress. So let's go ahead and pick. Don't choose Spring JDBCs. Choose Spring Boot Starter JDBC. Okay, click OK. If I include this, if I go ahead and run it, there will be a challenge. I'm not going to use debug mode right now. So let me switch off that and run it. It won't start. It will throw an exception. So what's the exception is? Exception is it is asking for URL details. That is database details. OK, either like uh, H2 database or H HSQL in memory database or external MySQL database Oracle. We don't have any of those uh, databases uh, dependencies here, right? So then what is that technically happening? The Spring Boot is trying to create a data source since you have added JDBC. Since the JDBC dependency is added, automatically it is trying to cook up the data source. So where this data source, just now we saw that, right? So it's already there in your uh, Maven dependencies. Go straight into your uh, auto configuration org.springframework.boot.autoconfigure.jdbc. Where is that? Come on. Yeah, here. So under this, you have data source auto configuration. If you look at the data source auto configuration, what it does, it's trying to create a data source. OK, so this will try to create your data source. When this uh, data source configurations can be achieved is when, when you have the relevant database information. So it is unable to do. But you have the dependency in class path uh, and you don't have the database details, no driver information. You don't have MySQL driver added. You haven't given the database information in the properties file, but it does checks for all those things because this is the auto configuration that will be automatically enabled when you add your JDBC dependency onto it. Right now the thing is I don't want to include this. I don't want to include this database uh, data source configuration auto configuration. So in that way, uh, don't choose default. Let me provide a configuration for data source. I need JDBC. I will configure. I myself will configure the data source. I don't want Spring Boot to do it for me. In that case, you need to exclude them, right? There are different ways to exclude. First, let's go to traditional way in your Spring Boot application. You will have your exclusion option. Exclude org dot spring framework dot auto configure, right? Uh, I could not exactly re recall that. Just a second. So org dot spring framework dot boot dot auto configure dot jdbc dot data source auto configuration. I guess that's the class that we are trying to org dot spring framework dot boot dot auto configure org dot spring framework dot boot dot auto configure jdbc data source auto configuration 
data source yes and caps right i'm sorry just give it this no need of top coach Sorry, I'm spelling mistake. How to configure? Data shows auto configuration. dot class sorry great so what happens here is this particular data source auto configuration dot class is added into the exclusions list if you just go ahead and run this the program will not yell at us okay the compiler will never i mean the program uh, the bootstrap at the time of bootstrap the auto configuration challenges will not be there. It's because we have excluded them. See, I just printed that uh, text iPad M to chip enabled, uh, but still we have uh, the dependencies in place. Right, the JDBC library is there in my class path, but Spring Boot is not yelling at us because I instructed the Spring Boot not to use the default <coughs> data source configuration class. That's the point, right? So the same thing which you can, if in case I'm not using it, okay, then if you just run them again, then you will get the exception or literally an error. So the other way around that we can do is in the application.properties file, Spring auto configure dot exclude. So we have this uh, spring dot auto configure dot exclude, and here you'll be able to inject the one which you don't want to include in the auto configuration list okay so if in case you want to use one more you can just go ahead and use comma okay because it's a list so you can add as many number of configuration classes that you want to exclude okay so by this way let's go ahead and start this sorry this is ended with class there it should be of a class but here it's not required. Great, so we got the output. So either you can set it in the properties file, the classes, the auto configuration classes, which you don't want to include by default by the Spring Boot, or you can achieve it from the uh, Java class, uh, Java code, I mean, uh, in the Java program itself, by using the exclude property of your at Spring Boot application annotations. And there you can give multiple uh, configuration classes. Keep that in mind. The uh, the extension dot class is mandate when you use exclude property in your at Spring Boot application, but that's not required when you sit on top of the properties file. So by this way, you'll be able to uh, uh, shuttle between the configuration classes that you wanted uh, uh, the Spring Boot to use a default, or you want them to exclude and you want to offer it explicitly by yourself. You can achieve that as well. So what is the theme behind the Spring Boot? <clears throat> it's nothing but auto configuration. Okay, that's the theme. Rest is all the same, 
rest is all whatever you we study from the spring framework is what is going to be achieved the jpa data jpa um uh, the um the security part okay um using your controllers rest controllers everything is going to be the same only thing is spring boot is helping us to quickly deploy i'm sorry develop an application deploy the applications much faster so that's what which we have achieved if in case if it's going to be a web application you're going to have an embedded tomcat server and for that also you have our auto configurations if you want to do just list out that just go to this uh, spring boot auto configure and there we can create our own custom uh, auto configurations as well okay uh, i have that in my list so the next upcoming weeks we'll be seeing that as, as well so here we have a web okay org.spring framework web and uh, auto configure.web then we have mm, where is that web client web embedded dot Okay, I just tried to show you more. Yeah, now if you look at this, uh, this is a part of a web, okay, configurations. Okay, there's a configuration properties called server, prefix is server. <clears throat> there is a port. Default, the Tomcat will take the port of 8080. Okay, it will run under the port of 8080. Okay, but you can explicitly change. So these are the containers that are available. Okay, so you can see that. So what are the containers, servlet containers that are offered? Is Tomcat, Tomcat, Jetty, okay, and Undertow. <clears throat> so these are uh, the three major uh, containers, but they have also added something called Netty, which is an extension of Jetty. So these containers are there and default is Tomcat. But if in case you add Jetty explicitly, then it will pick that Jetty container as well. Now, this Tomcat will take default of uh, 8080 port, but there are chances where we can change the port number, right? So when you change the port number, then the auto configuration will automatically call the set port method to set the port that you're going to offer. So what is that uh, uh, declaration from the properties, configuration properties, server, server dot port, server dot address. So when you say server dot port, then what it means is you're setting the port using this set port method. <clears throat> that is the meaning. I'll just quickly show you that. Probably you would have worked on it, but I'm just recalling this. This is how it internally works. Okay, everything is through this auto configuration. So if in case we go ahead and add, let me remove the JDBC. And in the properties file, we don't need this. Sorry. At present. And add one dependency called web. Spring Boot Startup Web. And uh, after adding this, you can just go ahead and uh, run this application. And it'll launch the application in just a matter of seconds. So you can see one thing that you have to notice on the console is the port. So what is the port? 8080. Defaulted to port 8080. But you change. How you will change? You will go to the application.properties. Server is the prefix. Just now I showed that. Okay, it's going to dig into that prefix of server dot port. Right? Server dot port equals uh, let's say 8081. This time I want to kick up the server using 8081. So save them. So default 8080 will be ignored. And it will explicitly set the port with the help of that properties file. Uh, I'm sorry, the, pro the properties class that we have, which has the setter method for the port as well. And it will set that. So this will be 
mapped, but we will set it explicitly because it's a custom port. So let's go ahead and spin up the application. Now you notice that there's an 8081 comes in. Instead of default 8080, it takes 8081. This is what auto configuration is. This is what auto configuration is helping us to perform uh, with, with the help of uh, Spring Boot, where we don't need to manually do any configurations. Rather, the auto configuration is helping us to do the only thing that you will be depending on is the application.properties file. You'll be doing a lot of configuration in the application.property and that is more simplified rather than we write a boilerplate code for achieving the configuration setup. We just use the properties file to instruct the auto configuration to pick up the value that you want to provide during the auto configuration process. OK, so with that, you're achieving the actual uh, need of using a Spring Boot application. Is this clear? This is the fundamental. When you talk about when we talk about Spring Boot, we need to go to this depth and understand this. Plus, we need to create a custom auto configuration of our own. Uh, we need to create a, a library and then we need to plug in that library into our uh, Spring Boot application. And then we need to see whether our custom auto configuration is getting picked up. OK, that we will see next week. That will be quite interesting as well. These are more technical, but still it's essentially required so that it shows the level of knowledge that we need to gain out of the Spring Boot because Spring Boot means we just go ahead and create a Spring Boot application, start working on all the uh, uh, essential work. Yes, of course, that's what is required in the day in and day out of work, but still it's good to learn the depth of what Spring Boot technically does behind the scene, right? So all these what I'm explaining is behind the scene process. So Spring Boot means auto configuration. People who are pretty new to this environment or to the term called Spring Boot, please understand that Spring Boot means it's auto configuration is the theme. And how auto configuration works is by this way. Rest is all the same story of what we have already studied in Spring Framework. Is this clear? If you have any questions, please uh, come up because we are running out of time. So I don't want to consume more of your time. So next week we will see more uh, detail of the Spring Boot. And yes, we'll be growing by using all features of Spring Boot with security, JPA, MongoDB connectivity, everything, okay, including the dockerizing the applications, taking up our application into the AWS uh, cloud environment. Everything will be seen step by step. All these training sessions are free, but I cannot commit all Saturdays it will happen. Let's say next week I might. The next following week, I might not because it depends on the workload that I have in my official environment. So I don't want to give 100% commitment, but I'll try to make it. I'll try to make it uh, possibly the sessions on every week. But there are times where I might be having some personal commitments as well. So due to that, I might not be able to conduct sessions, but I'll try to keep it intact. Almost all week weekends, we will try to have it. Yeah, uh, if you have any questions, please do come up. Anything that you want to get clarified, please. I have shown both the uh, standalone core application and also standalone web application. This is happening because we have a Tomcat, embedded Tomcat. This we will discuss more in detail. So if you go to the dependency hierarchy and if you search for a transitive dependencies of Tomcat, you will see that there is a Tomcat embedded into the web. That's what I was about to show on the slide as well. So this is something that you need to understand. This is what happens. Technically, our application will go into the container, but now the application itself is having a container. What container is this? The servlet container, the Tomcat or the whichever the servlet container servers that are offering. Okay, app is controlling the container, but traditionally what we did was container used to control the app. So if you have a Tomcat, you can able to deploy multiple applications into that container and the container takes control of the application, but today, your application is taking control of the container and technically technically this is needed because whenever you want to spin up a microservice application then obviously you need to have a you need to go for a better choice of using embedded containers rather than depending on external containers right so nowadays we are going for dockerizing the application you can have multiple docker containers inside the docker container you can make use of these applications to spin up with the embedded servers or embedded containers servlet containers to make sure your web application is up and running in a microservice environment uh, setup. Okay, if time permits, we will also try to come up with developing microservice based applications in the session. So apart from this, if you have any questions, please do let me know. Uh, we will be discussing about the difference between the dot properties file and the YAML file as well, which we will be discussing it 
in the upcoming weeks. Any questions or any doubts that you want to get clarified? Sir? Yes, please. Uh, sir, this uh, HTS is like pretty new to me. Like I have one doubt regarding that. Yeah. So like by default, like we get all the dependencies like are, are like um, related to the like a Spring Cloud started like Netflix dual dependencies and all that. Of I'm talking course, about the API gateway. Of course, uh, you will get those dependencies. Let's say you're creating a startup project, right? Yeah. This is how you create a Spring Starter project in your STS. OK, it's nothing but an Eclipse only. So if you go next here where you can include the dependencies, right? So let's say Zool, OK, or uh, cloud, right? Let's say cloud. OK, if you go to the cloud, you'll be having Zipkin client, OK, Sleuth. You have config clients, Eureka server for microservices, discovery uh, dependencies, OK? The same way you have, uh, let's say Redis, you have. So you include them, and automatically the dependency will get loaded in your Maven repository. You're getting it. So let's yeah. say, for example, I want to include the JPA. Okay, Spring Data JPA. Hit next and click finish. So by this way, what happens is uh, while well, you're creating the project at that time, very first time, because your Maven repository will be empty at the time, very first time when you're creating the project, you try to list out all the dependencies here itself. When you're creating the very first time the project, you try to list out all the dependencies. So all those dependencies will be downloaded in your local Maven repository. And then, and then it's easy to access from here. Uh, any more application you create, you'll be able to access them here in the dependencies and click on add. Now, if you say Redis, technically I will not get Redis because I haven't, I haven't loaded the Redis dependencies. Okay, so that way you can do it. I guess this is what your question is, and I'm trying to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so that's how you do it. So STS uh, is a better choice. I advise you people to go with STS. OK, because it's pretty easy and uh, it's more convenient to work with Spring Boot application. Don't. But if you're working on your official missions, uh, official laptops or so where you are unable to use STS, then you have STS4 plugin available. You can make use of the plugin loaded into your Eclipse. OK, but still, even though you go for plugin, there are a few challenges might be there, which you can eliminate it uh, by researching on the Google. But advisably, if you have STS directly, it is more convenient. Yeah, any other question? So the reason for this live session is to ask more questions, okay? Rather than going on a one-way broadcasting, it should be a two-way broadcasting. So if in case you have any questions, please do let me know. Few things which I might not be aware of also. So at the time, I'll let you know later by researching. Whatever is possible which I can answer, I can do it. So anyone need any thing to be clarified, please do let me know. Please, uh, please understand the Spring Boot uh, intrinsic uh, work process. OK, so that's very important because when you go for any interviews, OK, sure this conference level can speak. During the interview. OK. So Spring Boot is just to develop some web application. Don't throw a, a kind of a simple light. Give more detailed explanations by understanding what technically happens behind the scene of Spring Boot. And Spring Boot is going to be the way of development henceforth. Yeah, any questions? So I'll be communicating through the channel which we are connected right so I'll be giving this recorded session details will be shared there so please uh, go through and uh, go through the recorded sessions if in case you have some doubts today we just understood and observed the basics of Spring Boot okay so going forward we will see more advanced implementations step by step so if in case you don't have any questions I guess we can close the session or if in case you have any questions